Absolutely. Wonderful. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Will's World Shorts. This is Plan, Practice, Perform, Pulling Off Virtual Events and Making It Look Easy uh, with my wonderful colleague, Kristen Whitson, um, along with being my colleague on Recollection Wisconsin Project. She is our digital project specialist, and she works with local history organizations um, and Recollection Wisconsin content partners. Uh, she provides access to the IMLS community memory, uh, sorry, provides assistance to the IMLS community memory project, and she contributes to the Midwest hub of the ALA Libraries Transforming Communities project. She is particularly interested in communities of practice, peer-to-peer -peer learning in the archives, and she enjoys making digitization and reformatting achievable for organizations of all shapes and sizes. Away from the computer screen, Kristen and her family enjoy food from start to finish, gardening, chicken keeping, which is for the eggs, harvesting, preparing, preserving, cooking, baking, and of course, the best part, eating. And I'm going to turn it over to her with that. Thanks, Andy. I'm really excited to be here with all of you today. Um, and I'm excited to share a little bit about some of my experiences with virtual events. And then at the end, hopefully hear from you too about what you have learned over these past couple of years of virtual events. Um, some of you may have attended last year's fantastic shorts webinar just about a year and a half ago with Andy and Vicki Tobias, um, who gave some great tips about virtual engagement. So if you haven't checked that out yet, please do. Um, and they laid a lot of the foundation for what I wanna talk about today. So some of today's talk is gonna be a little bit of like, here's what we have heard from people like you, like the Wills community, Vicki and um, Andy, about um, what uh, works in virtual environments. And then I put some of that into practice used it and went forward with it. And here's how it turned out. Um, also, I'd love to hear um, in the chat your feedback, impressions, questions as we go. Um, plus, we'll have time at the end. So um, a little bit of background about how I came to this lived experience in virtual events. In the summer of 2021, so last summer, Recollection Wisconsin held four virtual digital readiness fairs that ultimately had 270 attendees from 120 different organizations. So um, those four events were pretty uh, well attended, which was great. And if you're not familiar with Recollection Wisconsin, it's one of the consortia that Wills manages. Um, and one of our many projects at Recollection Wisconsin is connecting local history practitioners to each other to build relationships between them. So these digital readiness fairs um, presented in partnership with the Wisconsin Historical Society were aimed at local history practitioners who were interested in like digital history and digitization projects. Um, the fairs were part of a two year grant funded initiative to increase digital readiness in Wisconsin's local history community of practice. So because of the community driven nature of these events, it was really important to leave lots of space for attendees to connect with each other and with the speakers and hosts. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. Um, these events were four and a half hours long. They were four and a half hour long Zoom events, which is, that is a long time to ask people to be on Zoom. Um, so uh, we were really intentional about the way that these events happened, which is how all of these lessons really came to be. Um, the part of the reason they were four and a half hours is because these fairs had originally been planned, as many things were, to be in person um, before the pandemic. And if they had been in person, they would have been more like a day long sort of um, dynamic, you know, uh, like symposium type of an event. So because these were online, we actually shortened them up to this four and a half hour window of time. Um, because four and a half hours is a really long time, we were very careful about how we kept the content moving as well and how we planned speakers and breaks and engagement um, changes. Um, I think that what we learned can be just as applicable for a half hour or one hour or two hour event as it is for four hours. 
Um, and then I have to give a really big shout out here to Wills's admin team, um, especially Rebecca and Melody, who some of you may work with in other capacities. They gave us some fantastic, um, valuable feedback on the logistics and practical considerations. Um, so here's one of the many lessons. If it's at all possible, um, have team members on your side as you are moving through your planning process for a digital readiness um, or a digital um, virtual type of event. So today I'm going to tell you some of the things we learned along the way, some things that worked really well, some things that I had to learn the hard way so that hopefully you don't have to learn them the hard way. Um, we'll make the slides and recording available later, so don't feel like you need to take too many notes. Um, there's going to be a lot of stuff here that we've all experienced over the last couple of years of virtual events in the pandemic. So I'm hoping just to give you a few tidbits that you maybe haven't thought of or heard before um, to take with you into your next event. So let's go to the next slide, Andy. Okay. So the vast majority of events, uh, virtual events are held on Zoom. There are some other great platforms like StreamYard and some other things that I don't have a lot of experience with. I do have a pretty fair amount of experience with Zoom at this point. So this is what I wanna talk about. So one of our first considerations was, um, are we gonna hold this event as a meeting or a webinar? This may be a question you've addressed already. What we learned is that a meeting um, like this one, the one that we're in right now, allows for a lot more audience participation. Um, audience members can chat, they can unmute themselves, they can turn their cameras on, but it's also a bit less secure in terms of managing um, uh, participant um, interaction. So a webinar gives the host a lot more control over the participants, but then there are fewer ways for audience members to uh, connect to each other in a webinar. So in these events, because it was really important for us to um, uh, facilitate space for people to talk to each other as um, realistically and authentically as possible, we opted for the meeting format. We wanted um, the participants to do just what I just asked you to do, um, chime in in the chat, talk to each other, uh, sort of on the side, um, be able to talk to each other during breaks. That also meant though, that we had a few registration restrictions and some tech support behind the scenes um, just to monitor participation. In our case, we weren't really discussing anything like particularly controversial that could cause um, heated interactions. It was unlikely we were gonna get Zoom bombed or have any trouble, um, but it does happen, especially, you know, I think earlier uh, when in the, uh, pandemic when we were all really getting used to virtual events, it was um, a little bit scarier that we might get Zoom bombed. So it was really important to us to keep our audiences safe and comfortable. So we put precautions in place like this registration. So in either a Zoom meeting or a webinar, you can require registration. You probably know this already. We opted to require registration and we turned on the option to have manual approval process. So every single registration that came in um, an actual person, me, had to click, yes, this person can register. Um, it allowed us to have some control over who was registering. Even if I didn't recognize names specifically, I had a pretty good idea of who was coming. We didn't end up actually denying anybody's registration, but we had the option if we needed to. And then also to reduce confusion about the process and maximize the feeling of inclusivity. Um, we put this note about manual approval in the registration um, text. We're manually approving each registration for Zoom security. All non-bot participants are welcome. So a little bit of playful language there. And these events, these digital readiness fairs, were really about just as many library and other information organization events are. Um, this was really about making people feel comfortable in the subject matter. Uh, digitization projects can be really overwhelming for people who have never encountered them before. Um, and so the last thing we wanted to do is make people feel intimidated or like we had to approve their participation in the event. That wasn't it at all. We just wanted to make sure that they were, you know, good actors on their way to our event. So um, the required registration process also gave us an opportunity to ask some questions of participants ahead of time. And this turned out to be really valuable for us. So we asked participants just two really brief questions about their own digitization projects. 
And we gathered those answers and shared them with our speakers and hosts ahead of time. Um, and it helped us actually drive some content towards those questions. So um, we also used the form to uh, require participants to confirm that they had read and agreed to the code of conduct, um, which in our case was essentially, you know, treat others as you would like to be treated. Um, and again, this was just one more way for us to make sure that our participants felt safe and comfortable. So those are some thoughts on Zoom. Um, here's a few other things that we came across and learned um, that uh, a few that were on the top of our mind and a few that came up later. So first of all, timing, I'm sure you all have had to uh, consider, you know, what day of the week and what time you're going to do virtual events. We decided to stay away from Mondays or Fridays, which was pretty successful. Um, we considered doing a weekend fair, which we might have done if it were in person, but given the virtual nature of these events, um, I just could not imagine that we were going to get any kind of participation, you know, for a four and a half hour event on like a Saturday afternoon. Um, but with four and a half hour time block that didn't really leave us much uh, wiggle room for time of day. That's either morning or e or afternoon is what four and a half hours is. So we opted for some of both. Some events were in the morning and some were in the afternoon to allow people to come to one that would fit for their schedule. In terms of speakers, um, you know, something that we did and what I recommend is think about what information you're going to need from your speaker ahead of time. Um, this is easy to manage if you have like one or two speakers. Over the course of four fairs, we had 20 different speakers plus hosts. So we set up a Google form process um, to capture, you know, standardized amount of information from every speaker. Um, you know, that's a good place to get like uh, payment information if you're paying for an honorarium. And then something that is super important is to make sure that if you're recording your event, please get express permission from your speakers. Um, I do a fair amount of speaking events in things outside of Wills and Recollection Wisconsin. And this is something that's come up pretty recently actually was um, confusion about uh, if an event is gonna be recorded or not. So ask that question up front. And uh, if your speaker is not comfortable with that, then you can go from there. This was a new thing for us. One of our event speakers, this was really delightful, was a minor, um, a teen volunteer who was active in his historical society. And we were thrilled to have him. Our audience loved hearing from a teenager who was really interested in local history. Um, but we wanted to be super safe and considerate and careful with um, what we were exposing him to on a virtual event. So here's what we ended up doing. Uh, first of all, we made sure he had a parent guardian um, sign a permission form for him to participate. Uh, we did not share his last name, only his first name. We didn't really share too many personal details about him. We just said that his name was Connor, which this is out there in our recording. His name is Connor and um, he is from the Watertown area and he participated in the local historical society there. We didn't um, name his age, his school, anything like that. We also didn't show him on camera. We just had him voice over his slides um, so that we could share the recording later without his like image on the screen. So those are all some things to consider if you're pulling in participants who might be under the age of 18. Um, which I highly recommend. It's a great way to engage an audience that is not often engaged in something like this. And then hybrid events. If any of you have planned a hybrid event that has both virtual and in-person um, aspects, uh, my hat is off to you because it is actually much more complicated than um, planning just a virtual event or just an in-person event. So, you know, good for you if you've done that. Um, of our, our four fairs, two of ours had an in-person watch party. And um, I'm not looking at our audience list here, so I don't know if anybody here participated in any of those. I don't think so. But um, in those cases, we had two um, virtual fair hosts who hosted the, those watch parties themselves. And so um, what they did was basically become the tech liaison, the person who was operating the computer and the Zoom chat box, and also opened the door at their historical society, put out snacks, sort of um, monitored the um, technology and the in-person participants at the same time. So if that's, uh, my advice would be, if, they're, if you're gonna do something like that, make sure that you have 
a person or a few people on site and a person or a few people in the virtual space to monitor both at the same time. Um, okay, moving on to practicing before the event. Um, something that we did that was super successful that I would highly recommend that again, I hadn't thought of before we did these events is we put together sort of like a marketing kit for all of our partners. So we had four different hosts who were hosting fairs throughout the state. Um, you know, something like this will obviously depend on your partnership kind of structure. Um, but the hosts were responsible for um, inviting prospective attendees in their region of the state. They know their region better than we do. And so that was part of the reason for having local hosts. Um, so in some areas, internet and social media is a great way to promote events. In other areas, newspaper and radio ads is really the way to go. So in order to give these local hosts the most freedom, but also the most information, we put together shared Google Drive folders for each of the hosts that contained things like a sample press release, um, graphics um, that we had designed for them for their fair, uh, high resolution logos of all of the organizations involved, um, you know, the posters, speaker headshots and bios, um, detailed schedules. We shared all of that with the hosts in their own folder so that they could access them for whatever publicity needs they had. In terms of slides, I mean, I'm really getting into the nitty gritty of this stuff here because these are things that we encountered over and over again. And I wish that somebody had told me ahead of time. So in terms of slides, we very quickly determined that it would be easiest if we had one combined slideshow um, instead of sharing screens and potentially, you know, different technical needs between different speakers. Again, might not be the right choice for every event, but for us, I mean, the last thing I wanted to do was put people in a virtual room for four and a half hours and then make them like sit through our technical difficulties as we switched between speakers. Um, so we put all of our slides together in one combined slideshow and had all of our speakers just prompt us to the next slide. Um, so something else that we did, Andy uh, sent me a tip on this too, and some of our partners do something like this. We had a drop-in dress rehearsal a week before um, the event itself. So we had you know, uh, one for each of the four events. And these drop-in dress rehearsals were super helpful in um, getting everybody into like a comfortable headspace. We set up a two hour time period a week before each event. And we invited all the tech support, the hosts, their guest speakers to that dress rehearsal. They could drop in any time within the two hour window. We made sure that we had their slides ready for them. We checked out their mics and their cameras. We ran through their slides quickly to make sure there were no formatting issues. Really, it just gave everybody a chance to sort of get their heads in the game, I suppose, and ask any questions, um, answer anything we needed to talk about. We gave them some, in, the, all the speakers, some information about what was happening right before and right after their talk so they would have some context. So really, it just helped reduce nervousness for everybody. A couple of the things that we shared during that dress rehearsal were, one, the behind the scenes schedule, um, sort of like, a, like if you've ever been involved in theater, a stage manager, like run of show, um, we had that for behind the scenes and we shared that with all of our speakers and hosts. Um, it's not that the speakers really needed to see what was happening for all four and a half hours, but it gave them some context about, you know, just in case some emergency happened and they came in earlier, they came in late, they would know what was happening when they joined. And then as far as communication, um, we made sure to share some offline contact information like a phone number um, with everybody to uh, give us a backup plan just in case one of those emergencies happened. We also found it really helpful to set up a um, Slack channel just for the hosts and speakers and facilitators. So I realize not everybody uses Slack. Feel free to adapt this idea for something that works better um, for you. But um, we set up a, a channel, basically just a chat room that included hosts, facilitators, speakers, and um, Slack does invite, allow you to invite people from outside your organization. So this sort of like, it was almost like, again, to the stage manager analogy or stage crew analogy, it would be like if we all had headsets on and we could talk to each other while the show was going on. This was a, 
um, uh, chat room version of that. Um, and it was really helpful in case we were running early or running late or things needed to um, adjust in some way or another. Um, and because Zoom doesn't allow you to have like, it only allows you to have direct messages, not group messages, this was really helpful. Um, last thing on this, uh, I highly recommend sending two reminders to your speakers and your attendees a week before and a day before and putting that information at the top of their inbox. So engagement was something that we were um, really cognizant of. And again, if you have watched um, Andy and Vicki's great webinar from last year, um, this is something that we paid a lot of attention to, the kind of guidance that came out of that webinar. And I mean, four and a half hours is just a really long time. So um, the first thing I'm going to say, actually, we didn't do for these events, but it's a good um, practice. So consider some kind of like real world touch point for your audience, like something that takes this out of the realm of just the screen and puts it into the real world. For smaller events or smaller groups, like 10 or 15 people, um, if we had a little bit of funding, I would send out like inexpensive gift packages. This is an idea we got from a um, Will's staff retreat, actually. Um, so we, I have sent out gift packages that have like a pen, a little, a bag of tea or a little bit of coffee or a piece of candy, um, just to like connect in a way that is not just this big glowing screen that we're all on for so many hours a day. Um, one of the ideas that we did use for these um, uh, digital readiness fairs um, as a way to engage both the audience and some other colleagues is a brag deck. So some of you may have heard of brag decks before. Um, it served a ton of purposes for us. So a brag deck, if you aren't familiar, is a, it's a slideshow with a few slides on um, each of something that you'd like to brag about. So uh, we and our local hosts we asked around and asked colleagues um, at local history organizations in the region of each fair if there was something they really wanted to show off, something about a project, their library, their historical society. And this was a really good way to involve um, our organizations and colleagues that maybe weren't participating in another way, but could participate in this really small way. And they really appreciated the opportunity to connect with this um, you know, regional audience as well. And importantly, for the four and a half hour uh, engagement consideration, it gave our participants something to look at during the breaks, which we planned several of, um, that wasn't just a blank screen. It provided um, some interest. Sometimes it would give us something to talk about. Um, so if Andy hasn't already, nope, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna drop a link in the chat that shows you just what um, one of these looks like. Oh, she did it for me. Thanks, Andy. So check out that link in the chat if you get a chance. This is what the um, brag decks look like. Um, and again, nitty gritty, we put these together in Google Slides, which has an option to publish your slides by running them automatically at five second intervals, which we then uploaded to YouTube. So in case you're wondering the, the how to and the workflow, that's how it goes. Um, in addition to that behind the scenes, like stage management run of show schedule that I mentioned before, um, we also put together a less detailed version of the schedule for participants to see ahead of time. And this was to help manage sort of expectations or give the audience members all the information about just what was going to be happening for four and a half hours. Um, the outline of the time blocks and the content um, you know, gave them some idea. And then it also sort of like helped build anticipation for the speakers and the topics too. So these were all posted on our website ahead of time along with the registration link. Um, finally, this is something that was talked about in last year's webinar too, um, or the year before. So we had heard from people in that webinar, we'd heard from people in the local history community people really missed the informal connection time between uh, each other. So like if you're at an in-person meeting and you wander in 20 minutes ahead of time, or you, know, you stick around for the meeting after the meeting, um, you know, those are things that are hard to recreate in Zoom, but we gave it our best shot. And so the half hour before and half hour after these events were optional, um, just meet and greet times for people to hang out with each other. Those of us who were facilitating had some, uh, you know, 
questions or conversational prompts ready in case we needed to like keep things moving. Um, but I think some of the most valuable relationships were built or started or continued um, during those informal connection times. So that was really nice. All right, so you've done all of the planning. <laughs> you have someone supporting you behind the scenes. You're sharing links and chat, like you're all ready. If there is anything that I leave you with today, this is the most important thing I wanna tell you, which is in why it's in giant font on this slide, which is just try to relax. Um, all of the preparation, the practice, the planning, all of the schedules and the everything behind the scenes is so that you can let the event flow in a relaxed, calm manner, which will help your audience feel calm and at home. If they're calm, they're learning. Um, and the higher the host stress level, the more uncomfortable your audience will be. So additionally, here's something else that I learned the hard way <laughs> um, in uh, uh, a couple of our events, the first couple of our events. Um, despite all of this preparation, I was so like wound up in making sure that everything was perfect, that I was very strict on the schedule behind the scenes. Like I would not allow us to deviate one or two minutes from anything. And um, first of all, that's not a very enjoyable way to uh, spend an event that you've spent so much time uh, uh, preparing for. In one of these events, I actually um, cut people off as they were speaking because I was so concerned about the schedule. And that was the direct opposite of what we were hoping to do with these events. Um, so uh, that is a regret that I have. And it is a lesson that I want to pass on to you all as the audience is um, like, it's okay if things go a minute or two or 10 minutes over, you can work it out, you know, behind the scenes. Um, just letting people talk will almost never backfire on you. Now, we've all been in virtual events where somebody just continues to talk and talk and talk. And this was not that situation. I think those of us who are experienced facilitators can sort of help guide a conversation if that happens. Um, but my strong advice is to like breathe, speak more slowly than you think you need to, which is something lots of us have heard before, and just let the event um, happen and um, dial down the feeling of being wound up, which is where I was for those first couple of events. Um, so that's what I want to share about that. Uh, the last thing I just want to say is leave some room for talking and for questions and longer than you think you need to. This is something um, we've heard before too, that a silence might feel long to you as you are allowing people to think and chime in, um, but it is probably not as long as you think it is. So just uh, count to 10 or 15 or 20 when you're waiting for others to chime in. All right. You've done it. You did the event. You have successfully accomplished your 30 minute or one hour or two hour or four and a half hour event. And um, if you're anything like me, you have logged off and collapsed in a heap with your favorite beverage somewhere nearby. Um, you don't wanna leave all of that great content and goodwill just like hanging, just cut it off and then that's it, that's the end. So there's a few things that will really help you wrap this up nicely. Depending on the type of event, um, you might have several resources or links that were shared during your event. And I strongly recommend um, compiling a list of those resources um, and links that were shared in the chat too by participants. Um, compile those into a list and share with all of the people who registered afterwards. Um, you can also mention during the event itself that you're going to be sharing all those resources afterwards so that people don't feel like they need to be taking notes. So we did put together a document like this and we shared it on our fairs website that looks like Andy, thank you so much, like linked in the chat right there. So take a look at that when you get a chance. If you do create a follow up survey, which I strongly recommend, I'd also recommend sending that out twice, once the day after the event, once a week later. The follow-up survey is also a super valuable way to get quotes and feedback for um, whatever you need. In our case, this was a grant-funded project, and so having quotes from the FAIR participants to include in our grant reports was really valuable. Um, this is good for leadership or other stakeholders, too. Finally, 
you will have um, started a few good conversations during an event like this. And it's really key not to let the beginnings of those connections fall by the wayside. Um, get in touch with the people who are asking questions, sharing ideas, uh, continue those conversations, see if there's something you can work together on or other connections you can make. And then this is something we've heard from somebody who is a fair um, speaker for us. Um, you know, and I think we all know this too, but be consistent in those relationships so that they continue to build on the ideas that were sparked during the event. We've continued working with that speaker, with several of our speakers and participants and hosts in a lot of different ways long after these events were over. And um, even just those of us who planned the events together expanded our own networks of colleagues from working on this project together. So um, the relationships are really valuable. Stick with those and, and uh, carry them forward. So I think we're at the questions or comments portion of our time together. Um, those are just several like practical real life examples I'm glad to pass on to you all. We have time for questions, but I'd also love to hear from you either out loud or in chat if you have had experiences that you thought um, went particularly well, um, uh, or if you learned some lessons the hard way and would really like to help others learn that as well. Um, I would love to uh, use the rest of this time to have conversations about, you know, two years into this pandemic and virtual and hybrid events, what's going well, what did not go well that you have learned from. This is where I'm starting the countdown in my head of 15 to 20 seconds so that I don't feel like it's too silent for too long. Yeah, I can share a little something um, from the virtual library school world as we've tried to do different things, especially for longer classes that will engage the students and break it up. So be it a breakout room, all these wonderful tools in Zoom, or they keep improving their polling features. Um, so to get them to interact and not just think, oh, I can turn my mic off, I can turn my camera off, sit back and nobody's gonna even know I'm there. So some different ways to engage them. And a warm up question is always nice too, just because people going either to have it on the screen as people are coming in, they can respond in the chat or annotate. Those are different ways because everybody's coming in at different times. And yeah, that the small talk, I miss that with Zoom. You just, it's so hard to do. Like one right. person has a conversation and everybody listens basically. Right, that is exactly what happens. And um, you start talking about the weather and then like there's only so much weather you really can talk about. You know? um, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. So having the questions seated, but all of those are great. Those are great ideas. The warm up interactions. I have a colleague who does um, chat storms really often. If you're, okay. you I'm chat? not familiar with that. So this is cool. So it's um, you know, a question that has like a one to two word answer. So something like, um, you know, what do you? It could be something as simple as what do you see outside your window right now, or okay. what is something that you are really excited for about spring or summer or the season mm -hmm. or something. So everybody types their answer, but they don't submit it yet, and then the host okay. will like count down and say, "All right, everybody hit enter three, two, one," and then you okay. get all these answers popping up. And it's and it's really it's cool. It's a different way to do the warm up. Mm -hmm. part, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's nice because if you come in late, you don't see the previous chat. So if everybody right. knows to wait to submit yes. their chat, then everybody sees the answers. So. Right, yeah. yeah, yeah. Those are some super good ideas. Thank you so much for yeah. chiming in. No, yeah, you're welcome. Carol says, we offered our first Zoom meeting at the beginning of the pandemic with great enthusiasm, but didn't cap registration. Turns out our subscription only allowed for 200 attendees at any given moment. Um, you know, that is a good problem to have, Carol. Yeah, <laughs> this is, um, you know, this, I understand it's a problem because you wanted more than 200 people, but it's kind of the opposite of a problem. So good job, nice work. And I wonder if that 200 attendee cap um, is for like, paid uh, Zoom accounts or not paid Zoom accounts, or is that just across the board? Do you know, or does anybody know? Paid, but a shared account. Yeah, that makes sense. Great, good. 
John says, our local genealogy society has been doing hybrid meetings for a while. It is starting to catch on, especially for members that have moved out of the area. John, I'm curious to know, do you have like, so there's an online version and then do a bunch of people get together in person uh, for like an in-person watch party? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Currently, like our last meeting, it was about 50-50 for people uh, that, that were in person and the same that attended remotely. And have you run into any challenges with that hybrid um, model? Like are people having an okay time hearing and interacting with each other? Uh, for the most part, it goes pretty good. Once in a while, we did have to get like by like an omnidirectional microphone. So it can kind of peek, uh, pick up, you know, people so they don't have to come and stand in front of the laptop. And right. some people don't like, some people don't want to do that anyway. So sure, sure. Um, and then that way uh, you don't have to like repeat the questions because stuff like that. Um, it right. does get, I did find, you know, it is a little bit different, you know, where if, you got the speaker in person or versus the person uh, the, the main present presenter going via Zoom. Um, yep. So, but you know, it all has its own little challenges, but uh, for sure. overall it's been working out well, so. Good, good, I'm glad to hear it. Um, at one of our watch parties, there were maybe 13 or 15 people who gathered in person to watch the event. And they actually said that um, they, uh, it was hard for them to get the experience of both, but they both, they really appreciated both. So they liked being in person with uh, several other, you know, colleagues or other practitioners. And then um, they liked being able to see the content up on the big screen. They weren't sure that they were gonna have, um, you know, that same big screen on their own little computers but it was hard for them to pay attention to both. So mm -hmm. that may be, you know, just in our environment. Um, and I would imagine it's probably easier for a shorter meeting too. Yeah, yeah, for our meetings, yeah, we also try to have everyone introduce each other, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. whether in person or on screen. I mean, yeah. granted, you know, we probably only had maybe about 20 some odd people total, you know, but sure. you know, sure. it's not like we had hundreds, so. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for chiming in. Yeah. Um, and Carol, I think so too. Carol said, the biggest complaint I hear from instructors is a general dismay at the lack of immediate visual feedback from the audience. It's, it's very, very true. Um, and you kind of get used to it after a while, but like looking at a screen full of black boxes uh, without cameras, I'm not gonna ask anybody to turn their camera on. And you know, it's kind of nice for anybody who just doesn't feel like they can turn their camera on in a given situation or in a given moment, um, but it can be really hard. My mom's a high school teacher who taught all the way through the pandemic. I'm sure lots of teachers would say the same thing. Um, Anna, if you're teaching, this probably happens for you too, that it's just really hard to teach without knowing if your audience is um, engaged or, you know, making lunch, which is okay too. It's just hard to know how to, you know, gauge what you're doing as a speaker. Yeah. Um, Carol, I agree. Webinars have been amazing to really be able to invite more people. You know, I don't know that we would have gotten 270 people from across the country for these little Wisconsin digital readiness fairs um, if they weren't virtual. Not that many people would not have traveled, I don't think so. Uh, Christy said, I'm joining from New York State, a former Wisconsin librarian. Hi, Christy. We use the money from the ARPA grant to build kits that provide different levels of presentation and need based on location and type. I would like to hear more about that. The other library resource councils across New York State are also figuring out best practices for hybrid programming too. It is intimidating. Um, I would love to hear more about these kits if you feel like unmuting and talking about Sure. Um, so I'm going to turn my video on just because. Hi. Hi. Uh, <laughs> um, so we are, our IT person um, is assembling these kits based on sort of what we'd need at different locations um, from everything like they only have um, like LAN network and we need okay. a guy to like they have everything but um, XYZ. Um, and so we've got owls, we have two owls, we have MacBooks, we have um, different levels of like 
microphones uh -huh. Bluetooth, like and so it's a matter of like making all that stuff work friendly with <laughs> with each other and and like right. having a workflow and stuff so um but it's exciting and we even got cases to like take them around so like we can we can like bring the programming to our members too you know nice yeah nice. so how big are these kits i would imagine it probably differs based on what each location needs yeah he's got he he got four and okay. um each one has sort of like level a level b level c nice. um, you know and then there's even like a project projector with a screen that you can set up if you needed that um so yeah you can kind of cherry pick and see what you need um but they come in these big big cases like you would transport like um equipment and things so awesome cool great use of grant funds yes that's wonderful thank you yep and uh valerie yes polls really do help with gauging engagement um I think it can be, I agree. I really like using polls too. I think it can be hard to feel like the human or the humanity behind the people in a poll. Um, but that's really just missing, you know, in-person human to human interaction. And we can, you know, we can try in these virtual events and we do, this is what this is all about. Um, but if any of you have been doing more in-person events or in-person conferences lately, I just went to a conference last week in person. Sometimes there's just no substitute for being with folks in person. So this is a good um, substitute if we need to, and it's good for safety. It's good for maximum inclusion and opening up our spaces. Um, and that was my cat who came to visit. What else? Anybody have any questions for others too? All right. Well, I'm happy to stick around for a little while if anybody wants to chat some more, you know, the meeting after the meeting where everybody who has something else to get to um, rushes out the door. Hi, Sarah. Breakout rooms can be useful for social interaction too. Yeah. Oh, and you know what, here's something I actually didn't include that I should have is that um, uh, I have been in a situation where I've put folks in breakout rooms with like a set of questions to answer or discuss. And I didn't give them enough time and I gave them too many things to talk about in that breakout room, um, which has been a lesson learned for me because um, sometimes these small groups just take a little bit longer because of the technology, because people are introducing themselves again or they're sort of getting their footing. Um, just as if people were walking to a different room to have a small group in an in-person situation. Um, and so I've really learned to dial back the number of things that I ask them to talk about in a breakout room like two or three max for 10 or 15 minutes. So yeah, good to have a facilitator in the breakout room too. I agree, I agree. Um, depending on the situation, sometimes it's good to uh, leave a group to their own devices, but I think it is also really good to have a facilitator to keep things moving. Thanks Sarah for chiming in. I'm glad that we got a chance to talk about that a little bit. Well, thanks everybody. If you're in Wisconsin, I hope you're staying nice and cool. Um, we can talk about the weather for a while if you want. It's remarkable weather right now.